Hello friends, a very warm welcome to our viewers who have joined from different parts of the world. Welcome to the sixth session of APCR SHR 10 virtual, the ongoing virtual series of the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights, co-hosted by APCR SHR 10, Reproductive Health Association of Cambodia and CNS. This virtual conference features 14 online thematic sessions spread over June to December 2020, with plenary speakers and top-ranking abstract presenters sharing their insights around sexual and reproductive health and rights and sustainable development goals in the Asia-Pacific regional context. These sessions are also streamed live on the Facebook pages of APCR SHR 10 and CNS. Today's session, which as I said, is the sixth in the series, focuses on innovative financing for sexual and reproductive health and rights in Asia and the Pacific. Now I hand over the mic to our chairperson, Dr. Ashish Bajracharya. He is Population Council's Deputy Director for Global Country Strategy and Regional Representative for South and East Asia. A PhD from Cornell University, Dr. Bajracharya is a social demographer and behavioral scientist who specializes in issues related to gender, transitions to adulthood, maternal, sexual, and reproductive health, family planning, and HIV and AIDS outcomes of vulnerable populations, and rigorous evaluations of health financing and health system strengthening in low and middle income countries. My goodness, he's wearing too many hats. His work covers Cambodia, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Nepal, Philippines, and Vietnam. Over to you, Ashish. Thanks so much, Shobha. Um, it is a great privilege uh, for me to be chairing this session on a topic that is very close to my heart, uh, innovations in financing for SRHR in the Asia and the Pacific. Um, the Asia Pacific region, as you all know, has been witnessing r very rapid development over the last several decades. And the benefits of that, unfortunately, have not been enjoyed equitably uh, across populations. Despite this economic, uh, economic growth, uh, and as you know, I mean, the situation has changed somewhat in the last six months due to COVID-19, but over the last several decades, the, the economic growth that has come to the Asia and the Pacific have also resulted in corresponding improvements to health service delivery infrastructure. However, uh, vast swaths of the population uh, still have unmet needs in SRHR. In many countries, um, out-of-pocket expenditures continue to finance most of the healthcare expenditures, and uh, these are unjustly reserved for the elite few uh, in terms of quality services as well as timely services. There are also socio-demographic uh, processes at play, such as urbanization or labor migration that expose vulnerable populations to additional health risks. And uh, to address some of these issues, it's critical to work towards universal health coverage and to promote sustainable financing strategies, including heightening of commitment of state resources for sexual and reproductive health. When we began to plan this session, we wanted to cover the entire diversity of issues that are part of uh, financing for uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights. And we feel that the panel that we have today with distinguished speakers really does cover that diversity of issues. And we have also great geographical representation. We're also very privileged to have um, a, a distinguished a plenary speaker, which we will start with. Um, and the plenary talk will be on a topic that is very uh, close to what we are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis at the moment on COVID-19. Uh, our distinguished plenary speaker is Mr. Kazi, uh, AKM Mohil Islam, who served in the Bangladesh Civil Service for more than 30 years and recently retired as the Director General of the Director General of Family Planning under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare in Bangladesh. As Director General, Mr. Islam implemented a diverse range of programs in maternal and child health, in sexual and reproductive health, adolescent health, nutrition, and uh, school health education. As the Chief Health Innovation Officer of the Health Ministry, he identified 24 new innovations in the area of family planning and replicate them, replicated them at the field level, which has resulted in a gradual decline of child mortality 
and improvement in maternal health and institutional delivery outcomes in Bangladesh. He also introduced an in, in innovation called NIOR, which is aimed at women's empowerment. I will hand over the platform now to Mr. Islam, who will speak about COVID-19 and SRHR issues in Bangladesh. Off to you, Mr. Islam. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and all the distinguished uh, participants and presenters. Thank you very much. I, I, I must thank the organizers for organizing this kind of very important program uh, during this pandemic, which is making our life hell. So welcome to my presentation, COVID-19 and SRHR issues in Bangladesh. Uh, this is Bangladesh in the north, in the west, in the east. We have a border with India and in the south uh, is we have border with Myanmar and in the south Bay of Bengal. We have 160 million people. Uh, COVID uh, virus, this uh, coronavirus was first detected in Bangladesh on 8th of March 2020. And as of 30th August, the total number of infected persons is more than 310,000. Uh, and the total number of recovery is 200, more than 201,000. 1, and um, till yesterday, the death, uh, total death due to COVID is uh, 4,248. Rate of diagnosis from test uh, is 20.25 percent. What happened when uh, COVID was first detected in Bangladesh? People were initially panicked. And the virus was um, causing death at that time to many countries like you know, China, in Europe, in America. And many people were scared and many people were uh, indifferent because they were not aware of the emerging problem of the nightmare. And also the virus is relatively unknown, so the treatment is also that not much known. And for obvious reason, due to impact of the COVID patients, the priority in the health was shifted for treating the COVID patients, but the need for family planning was unchanged, and the necessity to meet the reproductive health and needs also was important. The uh, due to you know stay at home and uh, physical movements were severely affected, and the significant impact was on the access to family planning services including sexual and reproductive health service. The uh, health of uh, health and SRH needs of the women and adolescent girls are at risk, especially access to the antenatal care during delivery and postnatal care. Government of Bangladesh, GOB, uh, declared holidays from general holidays from 26 March 2020. And they uh, and took measures for infection control and prevention, and also disseminated information on do's and don'ts during the pandemic. It's really encouraging that the government of Bangladesh and all the development partners, implementation partners, they are working together uh, in in COVID-19 emergency response. Government is also trying to ensure a screening, testing, and treatment of COVID-19 positive cases. We are aware that the contraception and family planning services are life-saving and important at all times. Doesn't matter whether it is COVID pandemic or government has taken other programs like. Uh, government decided to keep all the service centers open 24 hours and uh, necessary training for handling these COVID patients was uh, given to the uh, service providers at the center and also the personal protective equipment and other safety equipment and materials were gradually distributed within to the remote and community level at the quickest possible time. Government of Bangladesh has formed a national committee to suggest actions and strategies on to handle the pandemic. And the national committee has developed national preparation and response plan developed on the basis of government policy, WHO's guideline, and prevailing situation of the pandemic. While preparing the plan, the national plan, 
uh, the UNFPA's uh, recent projection on the increase of unintended pregnancy with the continuation of lockdown has been taken into account. And the plan also considered the impact on an already strained health system and complications that arise from termination of pregnancy. Regarding participation of different stakeholders in, in handling this COVID, representatives from the Director General of Family Planning, the Health Service, UNFPA, DC, USAID, ODSB, GSB, SMC, IPAS, IPFP, IPPF, uh, Pathfinder, and uh, many other organizations all are working together in Bangladesh to handle this COVID-19. And the stakeholders are providing information on family planning and CH, maternal and child health at community level by recruiting volunteers. And also UNFPA held in recruiting family planning facilitators where our regular government workers are in short. So they are working in 25 districts and sharing the updated information and also trying to ensure the quality service at the rural level. The National Committee that I was talking about has given some directions and recommendations to handle this COVID-19 and to take care of the SRA issue. The uh, policy for the policymakers, the directions were to ensure enough supply of contraceptives at all service centers, to ensure supportive supervision for monitoring and availability of the common commodities, and very importantly the well-being of the provider through direct and virtual communication. The National Committee also recommended that the sexual and reproductive health service providers uh, should use the mobile phones during uh, pandemic and also use the digital technologies and devices uh, to increase the telecounseling and sharing of messages related to safe and effective use of contraception. To ensure immediate postpartum contraceptive services, preferably PP, IUD, PP, implant, or fugal ligation after proper counseling and consent of the staff. To make contraceptives available to service providers. The National Committee also suggested to relax restrictions on the quantity, the cycle of short acting contraceptives dispensed to users to avoid or reduce frequency of visits during pandemic. To develop the and dis disseminate message with simple language through different communication channels, channels including uh, TVC, TV scrolling, social media, radio community, radio and TV talks, so etc. Director General of Family Planning has taken some special initiatives on this array. They have sent suggestions to all the service centers for using short acting methods like oral pill, condoms, injectable. Instructed for maintaining physical distancing, provided funds to purchase hygiene management equipment for all FP service centers across the country. With the support of UNFPA, DGFP has developed appropriate BCC materials, behavior change and communication materials, and those have been sent to all corners of Bangladesh. And BJP is also encouraging to use the depot system where the community people participate in dispensing the family planning information and items. The contraceptive prevalence rate, we are very much worried about this because you see uh, at the beginning during 1975 or so, the CPR was around 8%. Now it is uh, gradually increasing and uh, it, it's around 62%. But we are very much worried that this kind of uh, pandemic is uh, creating huge problems in our movement and uh, the CPR rate is increasing. I just made this table. Uh, you know, during pandemic, it is not very easy to collect information. Data is a serious issue now. But however, I have tried to collect one information that the sale of 
uh, short acting uh, family planning methods like PIL, condom, ECP, those have been increased. If you compare the sale in May 2020 to that of May 2019, PILs were sold 24 million in May 19, but it's 27 million in May 2020. Condoms have also increased, it is increased, but injection did not increase much. And the Bangladesh being a thickly populated country, we always talk about the population growth. We want to manage it very carefully. And now the population growth is around 1.3. Uh, I am showing you the uh, latest census from 2011, but the latest one is 1.3 now. So this population growth is also uh, directly related with the CPR. And this stock of contraceptives during um, pandemic, it contraceptives were always available to throughout Bangladesh in all regional warehouses and in sub districts and in the in the community level. And the DGFP, the Family Planning Directorate, has a very modern method of uh, online logistic management information system. We call it LIMS, LMIS, and through LMIS, uh, the top position so uh, out Bangladesh was uh, certain even the movement was restricted. And the, uh, for this monitoring, there were no stock out um, of contraceptives during pandemic. And but the satellite system uh, through which the people are are always advocated for using family planning and the study um, uh, methods uh, have been hampered, hampered to a great extent. And the uh, trends of using modern methods are also also on, on the decline, although. Despite availability of contraceptives and all service centers remained open, there were poor turnout in the clients uh, and, and, and patients to the service center. Women used to refrain from visiting health facilities due to fears about COVID-19 exposure or due to movement restrictions. And uh, eventually, uh, the uptake of modern methods was on the decline. Uh, there has been significant decrease in, in uptake of long-term reversible contraceptives. Uh, here I have given one comparison that uh, the, the method in family planning method has been decreased. If you compare to the April 2019 to that of April 2020, the fields have been reduced by around 22-3%, condoms reduced by 33%, injections by 39% uh, and uh, same is the case with IUD implant imagery. These, these methods have been reduced to a great extent because of the constraints in movement and also for maintaining physical distancing. And I have uh, already, okay, I have already mentioned what the government has taken action. Now the future plan of the government is to protect the front line to adequately protect the front line health workers and also promoting short acting methods and also use of depot holders and organization of special programs, workshops and motivational activities in the divisional level, the sick level and community level as soon as the situation becomes common. And the GFP is also uh, uh, developing message with simple language so that people understand what exactly they have to do to maintain and to get rid of the COVID-19 problems and to get uh, help in the service program. Promoting telemedicine to AP, AP call centers, that is already in place. And a family planning task force will be uh, formed uh, for, for identification and also uh, to understand the operator issue. And uh, introducing a, uh, appropriate budgeting um, because uh, we have to we have to shift budget from less utilized aid to the COVID related and the aid and this year and the strategic priorities should be identified by the government so that we can handle the COVID nineteen and make specific recommendations to achieve various targets of AP and SRA. Those have been posted during the pandemic. In conclusion, I would like to mention, this is the same experience by everybody, that every day COVID-19 pandemic is teaching us new lessons. At present, 
SRA services are being provided as far as practicable during pandemic all over the country. Guidelines of WHO and Ministry of Health and Family Welfare Bangladesh are being followed. But we must be innovative to increase the use of modern methods even in this pandemic and ensure desirable SRA care for a better future. Let's hope the best for all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Islam. Uh, thank you for this very comprehensive overview of the collective efforts that are going on in Bangladesh to combat the effects of COVID-19 on SRHR services, which you rightly called as life-saving. Um, as you just mentioned in your very last slide, this is, um, you know, all of us are learning as we go with COVID-19. And, and it was uh, very encouraging to see that there is a collaborative effort of multiple partners with the government of Bangladesh and that there is a strong commitment to innovation to, to address these issues. So thanks so much. Uh, and after our plenary uh, talk, we now move on to our abstract presenters. We have four abstract presenters who will be speaking for 15 minutes each. The first presentation is from the Philippines uh, and I'm pleased to introduce Ms. Loida Almendares. Ms. Almendares is the program manager for uh, DKT Philippines, um, as well as um, for the national program. She's part-time national program manager for the Cooperative Movement for Encouraging No Scalpel Vasectomies, Seamen. She's also a regular guest lecturer at the University of uh, East Ramon Magsaysay Grad School, uh, a nurse by profession. Uh, Ms. Almendares has devoted herself to reproductive health and family planning development work since 1996. Recently, Ms. Almendares introduced and organized the Model Youth Oriented Rendezvous of Networks, Preventing AIDS, and Center for Adolescent Fertility Education, or Mirna's Cafe. The title of Ms. Almendares' presentation is SRHR in the Context of Socioeconomic Development and Equity, Sustainable uh, and Innovative Financing to Ensure SRHR Access for All with Public and Private Partnership Bridging. So I hand it off to Ms. Almendares. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Asher, for the introduction and to the conveners of this uh, virtual conference. So my presentation is about uh, sustainable and innovative financing to ensure sexual reproductive health and rights access to all through public-private partnership bridge fund. This is a CSO a project experience. The Philippine government law support public and private partnerships or engagement of civil society organizations and private sectors to actively participate in the development processes of the state. The Philippine constitution cited that the state shall recognize the importance of NGOs and people's organization in nation building. This was also reiterated in the local government code where LGUs or local government units are mandated to promote the formation and operation of NGOs, CSOs, and become active partners in the pursuit of local autonomy, especially in the delivery of basic services, capacity building, livelihood, and development of local uh, enterprise. As another example, the Republic Act 10924 or the General Appropriations Act of 2019 defines that the annual expenditure program of the national government and all of its instrumentalities allows the government to implement certain programs and projects in partnerships with the CSOs to receive public funds. Moreover, in our implementing rules and regulations, the IRR 9184 Procurement Act state that when an appropriation or law of ordinance earmarks an amount to be contracted to CSOs, the procuring entity may enter into a MOA or memorandum of agreement with an NGO subject to guidelines issued. Further to this, we have the Republic Act 10 t or the Responsible Parenthood and Reproductive Health Law, which stipulate the private sector and CSO involvement. The government agencies may engage the private sector in the implementation of RPRH through effective partnership and cooperation subject to CSO accreditation requirements 
and restrictions as may be provided for in applicable guidelines. For a more concrete application of the laws in reproductive health services, were manifested in policies and guidelines issued by the lead stewards of population and health system in the Philippines. National agencies in population, health, and social development call for accreditation and engagement of civil society organizations by the government to address unmet need for family planning and provide other responsible parenthood and reproductive health services. An example of this is a Department of Health memo 2015-36 which orders DOH regional offices as the lead coordinators at the regional level of the national implementation team for the responsible parenthood and reproductive health law to hire consultants or partner with uh, CSOs to fast track delivery of RH related services. On the other hand, the Commission on Population and Development issued Notice 2019-11003 for the guidelines for accreditation of CSOs as implementing entity of PAPCOM funds. PAPCOM has accredited and engaged more than 20 CSOs and uh, these CSOs are now uh, mobilized nationwide uh, implementing FP services with, with their local uh, chapters. In the past decades, the Philippine government budget for health has increased significantly from around 10 billion in 2000 to more than 100 billion in the past few years. Public private partnerships or PPPs were where government financial resources are combined with CSO's capabilities and human resource is imperative to address unmet need for family planning and increasing teenage pregnancies and maternal infant death. In the, in the table, we see that while there is a deficit in government and medical professionals, doctors, nurses, and midwives in the public sector, there is an exist of nurses and doctors in the private sector. This data is from the National, National Database for Human Resource for, for Health Information System 2913 as reported by the PLGPMI and the Coalition for Primary Health Care. Give, given the limitation in um, government health human resource, PPP or public-private partnership is important to escalate delivery of quality reproductive health and rights services with financial resources from the government and human resources from the CSO or private uh, sector. In our experience, the Department of Health allocated funds for mobilizing CSOs, but the guidelines or, of transferring government funds to private organization requires tedious process and funds are often uh, delayed. We recognize adherence to government accounting and auditing rules is equally important. Thus, um, the engagement process becomes more difficult with compliance to these uh, requirements. First and foremost, just to uh, discuss the process, the engagement process, the partner CSO should be accredited by the funding agency to receive public funds. Uh, field jobs and other required supporting documents were required by our bids and awards committee or the BAC to qualify for the eligibility assessment and BAC certification. A more recent, uh, with the Department of Health Administrative Order 2020 was issued. This is a uh, specifying guidelines for the accreditation of civil society organizations as implementing entities of programs and projects of the DOH. However, uh, to date, we still have to see accredited uh, CSOs. On the technical aspect, um, the CSO project proposals, work and financial plans should be aligned to the approved annual work and financial plan of the agency. Once the memorandum of agreement is approved or signed, fund transfer is given in tranches. Usually, this is given in three tranches, 30% upon signing of the MOA, 50% upon completion of the 50% uh, percent of project deliverable, and 20% after the submission of the project report. Technical and fund utilization reports are required prior to releasing 
the second and third tranches, which will take about two to three months for the process and uh, release. With these delays in fund release happened, to address this gap, to address this gap and uh, to immediately allow CSOs to implement RH activities, PPP bridge funding was uh, demonstrated. With the PPP bridge funding, CSOs and NGOs or even the private sector need to have available funds for implementation of government project or a bridge fund, while the funds from the DOH or other national government agencies have not yet been released. PPP through bridge funding is an intermediate a financing mechanism to address the gap due to fund delays. It also immediately allows reproductive health services and activities to be provided sooner, even while the government has yet to release project funds for the CSO. And also, a bridge funding ensures sufficient funds during apply project implementations. So how does uh, it work? The revised IRR or Implementing Rules and Regulations of 9184 state that uh, when an appropriation or law ordinance earmarks an amount to be contracted to CSOs, the procuring entity may, con may enter into a MOA or Memorandum of Agreement. Thus, the PPP is bonded by a Memorandum of Agreement or Contract of Service between the national government and the CSOs. CSOs who have existing or approved project contracts with the government may access the bridge fund. Also, the bridge fund provider and the CSO will have a separate agreement which includes provisions on the utilization of the bridge fund, the amount to be released, and the terms of uh, payment. The bridge fund is strictly used for project uh, implementation. The amount ranges from 30 to 35 percent of the total project fund, since the government funds are given in uh, tranches. After receiving the final tranche, the tranche payment, the CSO shall return the bridge fund to the financing entity or organization at zero interest. The CSO funds are used to reach out communities and key population needing reproductive health services. Usually, CSOs implements uh, programs and activities that are were not uh, provided by the public sector. So they reach more um, population, they reach more clients. Evaluation is based on the number of couples with unmet need for FP address and other non-family planning uh, program objectives like uh, work with adolescents, HIV counseling and testing, or maternal and infant nutrition. Deliverables uh, given to CSOs shall contribute to the health outcome. In our FP project experience, the public-private uh, partnership in family planning reached 13,083 women with unmet need. Of these, 7,980 or 61% were provided with long-acting and permanent methods, which is more than triple the 14% average for these methods in the Philippines. For the HIV program, the PPP was able to reach out and test 678 clients in three months period, or 226 clients per month. Persons living with HIV were then referred to treatment hubs for immediate uh, care. We have different uh, PPP bridge fund modalities that we can uh, explore. In our project implementation, the model that we demonstrated was national agency funded the project, in this case, is the Department of Health. The PPP bridge fund was provided by the Philippine Center for Population and Development. It is an NGO in the Philippines which supports initiatives to influence people's views and promote actions towards long-term human uh, development and an appropriate balance between population and resources. The implementing CSOs who receive the bridge fund are from the regions or provinces. 
Other mod mod modalities that may be explored are collaboration between national government agencies and the CSOs. Uh, the local government units can also provide a bridge fund through their local development fund. Um, one possible source of this is uh, the Gender and Development Fund in the Philippines, where it is uh, utilized for um, gender-related uh, concerns or activities, wherein reproductive health is one of them. Financing institutions like Land Bank of the Philippines or microfinance such as CARD Incorporated can also be a provider of the bridge fund. And also development partners as part of uh, the Philippine government's technical assistance is uh, capacitating local CSOs. The BPP bridge fund mechanism is based on the Philippine context where the government has funds but less human resource. And among CSOs that have the, the capabil capability and available personnel but funding is limited. Even in times of pandemic, CSOs have shown robust effort and contribution in sustaining availability of services in the community. While PPP is recognized as an effective strategy for improving health outcomes, there is still a need for an enabling policy at the LGU level, especially for sexual reproductive health and rights program. The policy challenge here for government funding of CSOs providing health services where and when it is difficult for the public sector is the process of uh, procurement, which uh, cause fund delays. Until it is, it is resolved, this model of PPP and bridge funding is needed and recommended. While the government allows public funding for CSOs, we also encourage CSOs to explore sustainability mechanisms such as securing national health insurance program accreditation for reimbursement. And with our universal healthcare law and access to pooled fund for the UHC, CHO, CSO and private sector recognition by LGUs is important to be engaged in the management and financial integration of provinces and cities for UHC law implementation. So as a member of local CSO who are working in rural, poor and geographically isolated communities, we call for strengthening PPPs by supporting CSOs through sustainable and innovative financing such as the bridge fund model. So thank you very much and mabuhay to sexual and reproductive health rights advocates. Once again, Lloyd Almendares from Cooperative Movement for encouraging NSV. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Almendares, for, uh, for presenting on this very uh, nice innovation featuring public and private partnerships to solve uh, delays and bottlenecks in financing for these critical services through these zero fund bridge funding loans. Uh, this is really uh, an interesting presentation from the Philippines. We really thank you for that. Um, we have our next presenter, the second abstract. Uh, will be from Pakistan. The title of the presentation is Are Family Planning Vouchers Effective in Increasing the Use of imp uh, incre Increasing the Use, uh, Improving Equity, and Reaching the Underserved and Evaluation of a Voucher Program in Pakistan, which will be presented by Dr. Moazim Ali, who is an epidemiologist at the World Health Organization. He has worked as a public health researcher, medical practitioner, and an educator. He has more than 25 years of experience of managing research for health systems uh, and teaching health policy and management in low and middle income countries. He has also led the work in designing and implementing research to strengthen health systems and services during and after health emergencies. So I will pass it on to Dr. Moazam. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present the result of the research project on demand side financing, uh, using family planning vouchers to increase use and reaching the underserved in Pakistan. Uh, broadly speaking, uh, the un universal health coverage has three main components. That is to increase access to the services uh, increase scope that is in quality and the quantity of the services and financial protection that is to cover those who cannot afford the services. So these three components 
comprise universal health coverage. And in this context, we, we are trying to see if voucher can contribute in achieving the universal health coverage, especially in the context of sexual and reproductive health, and more specifically uh, through family plan. Uh, in, when we talk about the demand side financing, uh, there are three preconditions that we must be very clear on. The demand side financing includes a conditional cash transfer, the community-based financing, the vouchers and few other mechanisms. So the three uh, key components of the demand side financing are, there has to be a pre-specified target group, whether it is pregnant women, whether it is uh, under five children, whether it is some poor household uh, with a particular disease, then there has to be a financial transfer to the beneficiaries, either through the government, through the private sector or NGOs or other mechanisms. And uh, through, it can be directly conditional cash transfer or it can be via the vouchers. The third condition that has to be met in order to be called a demand side financing project, there has to be a very clear rationale for choice of services covered. Uh, it has to be a merit code with large positive externalities. Uh, we are very, you know, we have seen the examples of immunization. We, we are also familiar with family planning, the cancer screening and others. Uh, so these are the three main conditions. When they are met, we, we call that particular intervention as demand side financing. Now coming to uh, the background of Pakistan where the project was implemented, uh, there are approximately 220, 220 million population, which is making it the fifth largest um, as of recent. Uh, uh, overall contraceptive prevalence rate is very low, around 35%, and within that 26% is modern CPR. And if you look more closely uh, within the modern CPR, the LARC, which includes the intrauterine contraceptive devices and the implants, it is around two to three percent. And if you look more closely, the implant, the implant are around 0 0.1 percent uh, at, at national level. There are challenges uh, around 4.2 million pregnancies are unintended. Unmet need is also very high around 20 percent. At the same time, the DHS over the last couple of decades showed that the role of the private sector has been increasing from 34% to 52% as of recent, especially in the rural and the poorest population. Uh, the key study objectives for this uh, family planning voucher program was to uh, look at uh, the effectiveness of uh, single purpose voucher program in, in increasing the uptake, the use and better targeting of the modern contraception among the women in the lowest two quintiles uh, in a couple of districts, in a, in a district in Punjab province in Pakistan. When we say single voucher, uh, because there can be a single voucher or a multiple purpose voucher. In this case, the single purpose voucher uh, for the Mary Stoops International, which is a branch of Mary Stoops International in Pakistan, uh, includes follow-up, uh, includes the services uh, regarding the modern contraceptive, the follow-up side effect man management, and the removal services, for example, for implants and IUD. Um, it was a quasi-experimental um, study instruments. Um, there was an intervention in the control district. It was done in um, Punjab, one control, one intervention district. It was pilot tested and the approximate sample size was around 1276. Uh, broadly, the outline is that I'm going to just quickly touch upon uh, the utilization, the continuation, the targeting, uh, and also touching upon whether it impacts uh, the equity, um, it enhances equity among especially the poor, uh, the lowest two quintiles, as I have mentioned. Um, uh, Social demographic uh, characteristics, the married women of reproductive age, 
uh, there was no difference between the baseline and the end line. Approximately 31 years of age was um, on average. The age of the husband was also uh, plus minus the same, around 37 years. And um, the education status was around 12% were completely illiterate that they couldn't read or write. Otherwise, uh, there were a range of uh, level of literacy, especially mainly uh, at the primary level um, of education. Uh, that was the maximum in both these areas of in intervention and control at both baseline and end line. Now regarding the utilization of contraception, there are a couple of slides on this uh, topic. Uh, if you look at uh, the slide deck on the left side, there is intervention and then control. And similarly, the similar pattern follows on the right side. On the left side, uh, what I wanted to show is to compare the baseline in the intervention and the end line to basically highlight uh, that, uh, as you can see on the left side, which is the intervention district, we can see compared to 21% at the baseline, at the end line, the use of the modern method increase up to 51%. But also in the control uh, district, we can also see that it also increased from 18 to 32% in the control district. In the intervention on the right deck, we can see that the modern method uh, also increased uh, from baseline to end line in both the intervention and the control district, but they were more in the intervention district as it is shown from 19 to 50% compared to the traditional methods. Uh, this is another slide which basically um, also highlights uh, the utilization of the modern uh, of the family planning uh, method preferences uh, among the population. On the left side, you can see a range of pill. I, sorry, there is automatically going further. Uh, pill IUD injection implants, female sterilization, diaphragm withdrawal, lactational amenorrhea. So these were all the range of the method that were looked at. And as you can see um, uh, on, the, on the top of the slide, on the left, Chakwal, which is the intervention district, right, the Bakar district, as you can see that there is increase in the uh, modern method from 21 to 51% in the intervention area. And specifically, I would like to highlight that the IUD increased specifically in the intervention area from 2 to 20%, 20 uh, which was very low, which is around 1 to 2% generally at the national level. The condoms also increased from 7 to 13%. So uh, uh, basically, the, the, the idea is just to show that in the intervention area, the modern method increased significantly as is shown by the p-values. Uh, this slide is basically showing the difference in difference analysis, especially in the context of utilization. Again, on the left side, we see the ever users, current users, modern method. Then there is a range of the method, which is the pill, IUD, injection, implant, condoms, sterilization, and then the range of traditional methods. Uh, here we have, uh, as you can see on the on the top, the control, intervention, absolute difference, and the net effect. Uh, where, when we say uh, absolute difference, absolute difference is the percentage change from the baseline to end line, while the net effect is the percentage change in the intervention group minus the change in the control group. So basically, uh, I'll just highlight um, uh, highlight the change in the net effect. Uh, we can see that there is increase of 11% in ever users, 16% increase in current users, and uh, we see a 26 percentage point increase in the use of modern methods. Uh, so overall, the, in the modern method increased when we compare the control and intervention along with the base and end line um, after following the intervention. This is another area that I wanted to highlight. That is the method continuation switching. Uh, 
Uh, in this area, uh, my I think for any public health provider, it is very important to highlight how the method is being continued over a period of time. What is the level of discontinuation? And if people discontinue the method, what is the level of switching in these areas uh, among the population? So on the left side is the intervention area. And we can see that the discontinuation uh, of any modern method compared to the uh, control area, which is on the right side, is 13.7% versus 26.8 in the control area, which is very low in the intervention. And those who have done the uh, uh, discontinuation, the switching to different modern method is very high in the intervention area, which is 46.6 compared to the control area. And I'm not showing all the details of the result, but many of these uh, people who switch to modern method, they switch to um, IUDs, implants, and uh, injectables and pills, which is uh, very, very effective compared to the traditional uh, family planning methods. Um, now, just a little bit of focus on targeting. Basically, we wanted to see whether we are reaching out to the people that we have to reach out to. Uh, that is the lowest two quintiles. And in this, I just, uh, this is a um, multi-level um, logistic regression model. And I just want to highlight only one aspect. If you look at uh, in the middle of the slide, there is wealth quintile showing poorest, poor, average, rich, and richest, the five quintiles. And as you can see that uh, the poorest and the poor uh, in the slide shows that uh, the current knowledge on one method ever use, current use, and the modern method use is comparatively higher than the other three quintiles. So that means that we are reaching out to the right people. Uh, we our targeting through the family planning vouchers have been successful in reaching those who need these services. Uh, this is uh, also trying to highlight whether we are reaching out to the people who deserve and who are needing these services through concentration curve of modern method use by voucher client, which is basically the lowest two quintiles and the general population. Uh, so the concentration curve of the voucher, uh, we can see that uh, the voucher clients and the general population, uh, the dotted green line is the voucher client and the red is the general population non-voucher users we can see that um, uh, the voucher clients and the general population lie above the line of equality, indicating a higher concentration of modern method use in poor population than in the rich one. For the general population- Dr. Ali, two minutes. Yes. Um, for general population, the concentration curve were above the line of equality, depicting use of modern method was more poor, uh, pro-poor. Uh, to summarize, the utilization uh, uh, aspect showed that the voucher increased use of modern methods, especially the long-acting reversible contraception methods, uh, along with other modern methods, pills and injectables. Uh, we were able to reach out to those people uh, who were underserved. Uh, the vouchers program in family planning also enhanced equity by reaching out to the poor who were using more modern method compared to their counterparts. And we also were able to demonstrate that uh, discontinuation was decreased, perhaps because of uh, the voucher mechanism and the associated better counseling mechanism that goes along with the whole package of family planning vouchers. And lastly, the summary. Uh, Vouchers can be highly effective too to increase access and use of family planning and reproductive health services. And in long term, vouchers can strengthen the health system capacity and provide a pathway to strategic purchasing power such as insurance or contracting in the long run and contributing in the context of universal health coverage in a low and middle income countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Um, it is really um, uh, great to see this presentation from Pakistan on the evidence of the success of this voucher program in, in achieving all of the, the goals that it set out to achieve. In particular, for me, uh, you know, one of the uh, things that 
uh, I wanted to point out was that, you know, using a case control design, uh, of course, increases our confidence in um, the validity of these, uh, if these um, results, but it was particularly encouraging to see that not only was uh, use of LARCs, uh, long-acting reversible contraceptives improved, but that there was uh, less discontinuation and more switching towards more effective methods. So it's really great to see that this program is succeeding. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Um, our next presentation will be from Professor Angela Dawson on the launch of the Asia Pacific Consortium for Emergency Contraception. Um, professor Dawson is Professor of Public Health at the Australian Center for Public and Population Health Research and Associate Dean of the International Faculty of Health at the University of Technology in Sydney. Uh, Professor Dawson is a public health social scientist with expertise in maternal and reproductive health service delivery to priority populations in Australia and lower and middle income countries. She has undertaken research into the delivery of reproductive health services in humanitarian settings, uh, the management of, and referral of women uh, who have experienced domestic violence, as well as access to abortion and contraception. Dr. Dawson is the convener of the Public Health Association of Australian Women's Health Special Interest Group, a member of the Intra-Agency Working Group on Reproductive Health in Crises, and Associate Editor of the journal BMC Pregnancy and Childbirth. Uh, I hand it over to Professor Dawson. Thank you very much. Um, I'm actually in New Zealand at the moment, so I I'd like to um, greet you. Um, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katao. I'd like to uh, give you warm greetings from Aotearoa, New Zealand, and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm giving this talk this afternoon, um, the Ngāi Tahu Iwi. So thanks very much for having me. This is um, uh, very exciting to launch the first Asia-Pacific Consortium for Emergency Contraception. So um, in this uh, short talk, I'd just like to um, cover a few points just uh, for those who are not aware of what EC or emergency contraception is and, and why it really is important, um, why we need a regional consortium and what, what are we actually trying to do who's involved and how you can get involved yourself. So um, to begin with, um, what is emergency contraception? Well, it's a post-coital contraception, the, the last time, I suppose, the last chance to pre prevent an unintended pregnancy. Uh, it's, it refers to a group of methods um, that can be used um, to prevent pregnancy after sexual intercourse, um, usually um, recommended uh, for use within five days, but they're more effect the, the more effective they are, the, the sooner that they're used. Um, EC can be used in a number of situations, obviously, when no contraception has been used in cases of sexual assault, um, when a woman has, um, uh, is, has not been protected by effective contraception, or where there is a concern of a possible failure, um, or that the contraception has been used um, uh, ineffectively or, or not properly. So for example, condom breakage or slippage or incorrect use, or when a woman has missed three um, uh, lots of her um, combined oral contraceptive pills, or she's three hours late from the usual time of, of her um, progesterone only pill or mini pill, um, or more than uh, 70, uh, sorry, 27 hours um, after the previous pill. Or, for example, in the case where she's four weeks late for her depot or DMPA progesterone-only injection. So um, it, can, it can be used as a second, uh, a last chance to prevent um, pregnancy. So what is emergency contraception? There are a number of, of methods. Um, Levengestrel is the most commonly um, used form of EC. Um, uh, obviously effective 72 hours after um, uh, unprotected sex. Um, however, um, extra doses may be required in the case of obesity. The most um, effective uh, forms are really ulipristal acetate, um, a new um, uh, drug that um, has been available uh, just recently, or of course the copper IUD. And there are also um, the use of combined oral um, contraceptive pills, uh, um, use uh, uh, regime, 
or we could take the, the um, single dose of, of um, mifepristone. So obviously EC can reduce the risk of pregnancy following unprotected intercourse. Um, and there's a 75 to 90% chance of, depending on the method used with the most effective being um, the copper IUD. So um, in terms of the mode um, of action, um, EC pills prevent pregnancy by preventing or delaying ovulation, um, and they do not induce a, an abortion. Uh, the copper bearing IUD, it prevents um, fertilization um, by causing a chemical change. Um, so not allowing this um, uh, ch change in the sperm and before they meet, an egg before they meet. It can't interrupt an established pregnancy or harm um, a developing um, embryo. Um, the thing with um, emergency con contraception is there are a lot of challenges and issues related to uh, this form of contraception that make it um, a rather neglected form of, of contraception. Um, we know that there is a, a low knowledge amongst women of emergency contraception. Um, there are lots of myths and misunderstandings. Uh, it's often referred to as the morning after pill, uh, which um, it's uh, not quite correct. Um, there's a lot of misinformation in terms of it being known as an abort abortifacient, um, which restricts access to this contraception. So for example, recently in uh, Tamil Nadu, there was an, a reduction in accesses to stock um, of the eye pill. Uh, pharmacists felt uncomfortable stocking it, um, particularly to unmarried um, or adolescent women. Uh, there's also um, myths that it promotes pr uh, promiscuity, for example. Uh, the fact that it's only available um, on prescription only as opposed to um, uh, over-the-counter access can restrict access to, to EC. And um, there's a huge market in the Asia um, Pacific region. Um, in fact, that region accounts for a 25% share of the EC market as of January uh, 2020. And I was um, uh, pleased to see um, uh, Mr. Islam talking about increases in sales. Uh, so that, that's good news for, for, um, from my point of view. Anyway, um, in this uh, times, there's an, the need for EC is now more than ever. So the global pandemic um, uh, has also has obviously brought around uh, brought about quarantines and lockdowns, uh, which has increased rates of intimate intimate partner violence. Um, there are increased fear of um, uh, contracting um, COVID-19, which uh, has resulted in people uh, less likely to approach services or pharmacies. Uh, services have closed in some places or they've been restricted hours due to uh, the deployment of staff elsewhere. So that means less access to EC and uptake of also regular contraception, which obviously increased likelihood of un unintended pregnancy and possible contraceptive failures. There's issues with supply, procurement and, and distribution, not only of EC, but other contraception. And um, there's some interesting modeling um, in the Asia, um, uh, amongst Asian countries, 14 Asia Pacific countries, showing a predicted drop in unmet need for contraception um, and 30 about around 30 percent, um, 32 percent of women of reproductive age not being able to meet their family planning need needs this year. So um, very concerning times in terms of access to, to um, EC. Um, and we must always remember that, of course, um, uh, access to EC is a human rights issue. And uh, nowhere more were we reminded in the last conference in 2017 in Vietnam with, with a theme, leave no one behind, uh, justice in um, sexual and reproductive health. So all women and girls at risk of an unturned pregnancy have the right to access EC. Uh, it should be included routinely in all um, family planning programs and integrated into all health serv services, obviously. So enter um, the um, uh, emergency, the Asia Pacific Consortium for Emergency Contraception. And um, where we will be, uh, our website will be available 
available via the New South Wales um, uh, Family Planning website, who are hosting hosting us um, in Australia. Um, and the, the focus of um, this uh, consortium really is uh, three key things um, to uh, bring together uh, the latest knowledge in EC, synthesize that, summarize that, and share it. Uh, advocacy, um, obviously around evidence-based policy and practice and, and look at in innovative ways of, of, um, uh, of getting EC out and advocating for EC and obviously to support governments and, and um, INGOs and, and CBOs, et cetera, with technical assistance in terms of research and um, evaluation. So um, the uh, Asia Pacific um, Consortium for Emergency Contraception can really serve as an authoritative source of information. That's our key um, uh, sort of focus for uh, not only researchers, policymakers, health providers, et cetera, um, so that we can share the, the latest up-to-date clinical guidelines and fact sheets. Uh, and I talked about offering uh, technical um, assistance and advocacy support um, to increase access to facilitate the sharing of information and networking amongst all our members and providing a platform to generate new ideas and strategies relating to EC. But of course this consortium will join other consortiums um, uh, around the globe um, under the, the um, large banner of the International Consortium for Emergency Contraception. So, for example, in the European region, um, there is also there is already a well-established um, consortium, um, EC Afrique, um, and then there is the American Society. In the Arab world, there's also a group working on emergency contraception and in Latin America. And our work will be closely aligned with all of these um, uh, consortiums uh, and we hope to share um, our work and learn from each other. So um, the consortium itself in terms of networking, um, I talked about facilitating um, uh, research, health professional and service provider collaboration. Um, we're hoping to obviously have meetings, etc. hopefully face to face in the future. Um, and uh, advocacy, we want to dis uh, disseminate information and education through newsletters um, and um, uh, put uh, uh, tenders in for, for research and updates on EC. So far, we have um, members in Australia, Cambodia, uh, Fiji, Hong Kong, Kiribati, Japan, Malaysia, Nepal, Philippines, Solomon Islands, and Thailand. And those um, uh, uh, members are from a wide array of um, organizations, government organizations, um, NGOs, um, INGOs, such as IPPF are playing a large role in, in this um, work, researchers and health professionals themselves. So just to finish up, we are keen to get you involved as well. And I'm reaching out um, to, uh, in this time to um, encourage you to um, contact me or my colleague, um, uh, Deborah Bateson um, at um, Family Planning New South Wales to let us know if you'd like to be involved uh, so that we can um, build this work together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Dawson, for, for that really nice presentation on this new initiative, a really important one. And as, as you've just mentioned, you know, I encourage uh, the, the viewers who are watching us right now on Zoom to, uh, to uh, raise awareness about this network amongst your own networks. Uh, and I, I was really, uh, you know, it was really nice to see that this is aligned with global consortia as well, so that experience from the Asia Pacific region can be shared. Uh, with others as well as we can learn from other uh, regions as well. So the fourth and final presentation of today will be from Iran. Um, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Ms. Zara Fatih Geshignani, who has a decade of experience in project planning and management experience in the field of sexual and reproductive health and rights and is dedicated to working for women's empowerment. She has more than 10 years of experience in working with vulnerable groups and refugees and she was most recently uh, CEO of the Family Health Association of Iran. The, uh, the presentation that she'll be doing is entitled Investing 
for health and advocating for prioritizing research mobilization and allocation for the treatment of sexually transmitted infections and um, sensitizing um, sensitizing stakeholders and policymakers for supporting the HCV treatment for vulnerable groups in Iran. I pass it over to you, Ms. Zara. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. And uh, thank you for giving this opportunity to me to be a part of this panel. And also a special thanks to the conference organizer uh, for uh, creating this uh, wonderful uh, possibility for uh, during this pandemic. As uh, you said, I'm, um, the subject that I'm going to talk about is advo advocating on the, uh, for health, uh, advocating on prioritizing uh, resource mobilization and allocating for treatment of sexual and transmitted infection and sensitizing the stakeholder and policymaker for supporting the uh, HCG treatment for vulnerable groups. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to uh, um, to introduce briefly Family Health Association that this uh, project has been done by them. Uh, uh, Family Health Association of Iran is a non-governmental organization which was uh, established in 1994 and uh, FHA Iran contributed to promotion of sexual and reproductive health and rights for all, especially among uh, young people and vulnerable groups in consistence with social and cultural belief and value of the society. Uh, also, FHA Iran is a full member of uh, 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 International Planned Parenthood Federation and holder of a special consultative status from UN ECOSO. Uh, and also member of uh, World Hepatitis Alliance and member of CCM in Iran. Uh, FHA Iran provides comprehensive uh, uh, HR strategy service delivery points in Iran and has a strong com contribution in advocacy program for SRHR issue in the international, uh, national, regional, and international level. Uh, also, the representative of uh, FHA Iran particip participate in a uh, Human Rights Council meeting and uh, reading the statement and advocate for human rights. Uh, in this uh, article, uh, we, uh, provide, uh, uh, we uh, provide our article based on the first track, which was sexual and reproductive health in right uh, and right uh, in the context of socioeconomic development and equity. Uh, commitment uh, to SDG goals by the states. States and development partners have limited access to many. Uh, let me start. Cancel. Uh, limited access to many. Sorry, uh, competing uh, priorities. So it's important to ensure that SRHR is value and has resources are mobilized and allocated. Indeed, SRHR program and services will. Uh, require increase and sustain uh, finding in order for relevant SDG to be achieved by the by 2030 deadline. SRHR falls within the scope of fundamental human rights and is central to eradicating poverty and achieving sustainable development across social, economic, and environmental dimension. With the focus on preventing uh, investment in SRHR are not only critical uh, to people's uh, well-being and the uh, uh, prior, prosperity and resilience of family, community, and nation, but also are also demonstrably cost-effective and cost-saving, freeing resource for investing in other development priorities. Funding for sexual, funding for sexual and reproductive health and rights (SRHR), uh, which in, encompass a range of issues, including a universal access to SRHR services and supplies, comprehensive sexual education, and ending gender-based violence and harmful practices such as early child and forced marriage, sexual transmitted infection, are fundamental to uh, to the ability of all people, especially women, adolescents, girls, and young people, to lead full, satisfying, healthy, and uh, productive, productive lives. For this purpose, uh, the national government should uh, develop national financial action plan for SRHR, improve tracking of financial resources flows for SRHR, increase mobilization of uh, domestic public revenue for health, including SRHR, remove financial barriers to accessing SRHR services, and uh, regulate private sector uh, financing for provision of SRHR services. And the last one is a uh, strengthen monitoring and um, accountability for fulfillment of the financial commitment to SRHR. 
SRHR and hepatitis C. Uh, when we are talking about SRHR, and the most, uh, one of the most important part, part of that which should be considered is a sexual transmitted infection, such as HIV, uh, hepatitis, and, uh, hepatitis, uh, hepatitis B and C. In Iran, we provide free of charge services for testing and treatment of HIV AIDS and uh, zero behavioral counseling uh, centers and HIV uh, clubs. All the clients can receive these services uh, free of charge and in a very confidential and friendly environment. Also for the hepatitis B, all the health posts which are providing the primary health services to all uh, or the country, the client can be vaccinated, vaccinated free of charge. But for the HCV, we need to add it as one part of the country medical system. Free testing and treatment can be considered as the best way for reducing the incidence of this disease. Since hepatitis C is mainly passed on the throat using contaminated needle and syringe or sharing other items with infected blood on them, a special consideration to IDUs and uh, harm reduction services is crucial. Uh, at the moment, the Iran population is about uh, 84 uh, million and 200,000 uh, uh, people. And among them, the more than 186,000 people are infected by HCV. Uh, also, prevalence of the HCV in general population is about 0.31%, uh, uh, but it's, it's considerably different from its prevalence among the person who inject drugs uh, and uh, something like that, um, which is about uh, 51.46%. Also located in the Middle East, right face beside the biggest narcotic uh, procedure in the world and with an increasing number of injecting drug users, hepatitis C is uh, considered as a serious risk factor in our country, despite having relatively low prevalence in the Iranian general population, the burden of uh, hepatitis C uh, viral is predicted to be the most important leading cause of viral uh, hepatitis Lack of <clears throat> awareness among young uh, IDUs regarding the risk of uh, acquiring HCV infection via needle sharing are root cause of the increasing prevalence of HCV infection among IDUs community. Uh, for this purpose, the hardly and due these uh, horrifying uh, facts we moved us to advocate on uh, investing for HCV treatment as a way of prevention. Solution. Uh, by this uh, project, we find two solutions for this uh, um, issue, and uh, which was providing harm reduction services in the country. Actually, at the moment, we, we, have, we have all of, uh, lots of uh, drop-in center uh, in uh, all over the country, which provide harm reduction services for vulnerable groups, and they can go there and uh, receive these services uh, free of charge. And the second one, providing free, uh, free of charge testing and treatment as a way of uh, prevention. Treatment of even HCV infected population uh, is uh, interferone based in therapy and uh, as the first line therapy in the Iran due to affordability and local availability. Recently, the production of domestic uh, BAA with uh, health insurance coverage has been announced in Iran, paving the way for low cost access to BAAs and subsequently uh, widespread use of this uh, drug in the uh, near future. But the biggest problem is that the vulnerable group who are mostly from IDU, sex worker, and refugee don't have access to the health insurance. FHA Iran, as a pioneer NGO in providing SRHR services in the country, played a great role in the country for advocating on HCV treatment for a vulnerable group. For achieving synergic advantage, we have made connection with different CS of working on HCV, and for this purpose, signed an MOU with Iranian Hepatitis Network in order to uh, conduct some activity for raising public awareness. Then we prepared a fact sheet and hold some advocacy meeting with Iranian parliamentarians for sensitizing them about this issue. Also negotiated with the authorities from uh, University of Health uh, and other organizations uh, for attracting their support in order to provide free of charge uh, treatment for the key population. 
Uh, also, we hold some scientific panel about HCV alongside campaigning for that in order to convincing, uh, convince the policy maker to put HCV transmitted uh, treatment in their priority list for all allocation, allocating budget. Uh, this pan uh, panelists were uh, some delegation from Ministry of Health, Iran Hepatitis Network, uh, Parliamentarian, Tehran City Council, Prison Organization, which was uh, under the leadership of patron of FHA Iran. Also, FHA Iran held uh, lots of different workshops, seminar, and camp in order to raise awareness of global burden of viral hepatitis and highlighting the necessity of governmental and non-governmental aids to and support to prevent the diagnosis and treatment of hepatitis. In this regard, we prepared advocacy tools like a poster, brochure, and infographic data sheet increase public awareness about uh, HCV. During this journey, we re received uh, two achievements. We had two achievements in 2018 and in 2019. In 2018, we received uh, the membership of World Hepatitis Alliance, and uh, in 2019, we could um, achieve uh, forming an executive committee of stakeholders in order in order to advocate for providing free of charge HCV treatment for the key population. Activity done by Family Health Association of Iran for, uh, of Iran for advocating on providing services for people living with hepatitis uh, made it eligible to be a member of World Hepatitis Alliance. FHA Iran, the second is the second association in Iran which received this uh, membership. In the 31 volume of Hep Voice monthly magazine, uh, they have announced this news and introduced FHA Iran. As a result of, uh, as a result, FHA Iran formed a com uh, committee, uh, which is included of representative of parliamentary and representative of family deputy in a presidency of uh, office uh, and president of a national um, Hepatitis Network, Director of Hepatitis Office in Ministry of Health, response, uh, representative of NGO and CDO. Uh, in our meeting in this uh, committee, we prepare a brief policy note based on the fact sheet that uh, we had uh, prepared before. Based on, based on this uh, brief uh, policy note, uh, we sensitize the stakeholder and policy maker in order to put HCV treatment in their priority list and uh, as a part of country health and medical system. Conclusion. Investing on health. Health is a foundation for dynamic and prosperous world we all want to see. Health enables people to learn and earn, to start business and thrive. Health creates jobs, it drives uh, productivity, it stimulates uh, inclusive growth, and it's, uh, it protects economy from the impact of outbreak and other emergency. The implication of uh, positioning health finance as an investment, including uh, whether that approach aligned with the uh, vision of inclusive health services uh, that is all that is at the core of universal health coverage and uh, whether it can uh, guarantee sustainability. It is a point that should ask for it from the government, but they offer, um, unfortunately, they offer price um, investments that, that offer more immediate uh, returns like, uh, and uh, we can see the result of that in this pandemic. Investing on in HCV treatment. Since prevalence rate of HCV among vulnerable people in Iran is high for the first step, uh, providing free of charge and Two minutes, uh, voluntary, Sarah. yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, and voluntary testing uh, and treatment for IDU has been requested from the form executive committee. We will continue our meeting with the uh, committee and follow up the approvals. At the moment, we have received a few number of HCV rapid tests and treatment uh, from the uh, University of uh, Health and uh, Iranian Hepatitis uh, Network uh, for some of the clients as a pilot uh, phase of this uh, project. And this, uh, the result of that will be uh, reported to the government and uh, as a good practice for their future planning and investment. FHA Iran will continue this advocacy project as long as free testing and treatment of vulnerable people with hepatitis C become a part of the country health care program. During this journey, we faced lots of uh, challenges due to huge sanctions against, against Iran and also high rate inflation in, uh, in the country. We, uh, this project faced with uh, some delay for in implementation in large scale. And also uh, coronavirus pandemic has affected the approval and implementation of this project and now it's not in the priority list of the gover government. 
change of organizational and manager also affect this uh, project uh, implementation process. Uh, for this project, uh, I was honored to work with Dr. Safi Shahriyari Afshar, founder member and patron of the FHA Iran. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Zara, uh, for bringing to light uh, FHA Iran's uh, role in highlighting HCV treatment as a priority in the country's national program. As you mentioned, that you know, coronavirus has kind of changed that situation, but still, it, I think it was a really important effort in particular for highlighting the needs of vulnerable populations uh, such as injecting drug users and, and sex workers. I'm very mindful of time where I think right about at uh, half past the hour. So I'm going to pass the platform to Shoba who will be conducting the Q&A session. So off to you Shoba, before I do that, I received a note from Professor Angela Dawson that she's had an, a fire alarm in her building and she had to leave the building so questions directed to uh, Angela could be uh, emailed to her directly and she will respond. But uh, to the other panelists, I believe we can have a discussion now. Okay. Shoba? Thank you, Ashish. Thank you very much. Because we had many questions for Angela lined up, so we will send them to her by email. Thank you very much. Uh, friends, we now have the open session and participants, please type in your comments or questions in the chat box. And those watching on Facebook can type the questions in the comments box there. Uh, we already have a lot of questions that have come in. Uh, there is a question by Tasnia Ahmed, who is program officer at Serak, Bangladesh. And Tasnia says that due to COVID-19, many HIV test centers are closed and HIV burden is expected to increase by 10% over the next five years, uh, according to a study. And similarly, access to many youth-friendly health centers has been impacted due to COVID-19, even though there might be enough budget available for them. Uh, so, uh, Lloyda, would you like to answer this question that what initiatives are being taken in this regard? And I'm sure I also have something to say to that. Uh, because, Lloyda, you have organized that... Uh, a model youth oriented uh, rendezvous of networks preventing aids and center for adolescent uh, fertility education so would you like to answer tasnia's query yes Lloyda, are you there hello shoba yes yeah. yes can you repeat the question yes. please yes yes the yes. internet connection was uh... okay okay uh, the question is that due to COVID-19, many HIV test centers are closed and HIV burden is likely to increase because of this. Also, access to many youth-friendly health centers has been impacted due to COVID-19 restrictions, even though there might be enough budget available. So what initiatives are being taken in this regard? Um, in the Philippines, our community-based organizations um, were able to reach out uh, using the social media platforms to uh, assist our clients who wants to avail of uh, HIV tests. Also, the community-based organizations um, with the proper uh, PPE supplies, they continue to provide uh, services on HIV. Okay. So even with the pandemic, uh, the, our CBOs continue to provide the services. Okay. And Tasni also wanted to know if information technology is being used enough to provide family planning services or information to the youth. Uh, Ashish, would you like to comment? As well? uh, sure. Um, I think one thing that, you know, we recently wrote uh, an internal piece about this. And one thing that we said in that piece was that, uh, if anything, young people who are already uh, fully immersed in social media and in digital technologies are the most likely to be uh, to avail those services. So there is some advantages of having a very young group of people who are already familiar with digital media to use, uh, you know, counseling or telemedicine through social media or through digital means. So I think that's a positive. Certainly. Uh, I think it's too soon to know uh, if there's documented evidence around the effectiveness of these methods for young people as well as for the general population. I think there are uh, efforts that are going on. But uh, one positive thing is that the young people don't need any um, training or, 
or any uh, orientation needs for, for these type of methodologies. So I think it's a positive thing on that front. Oh, thank you. Uh, would any of the other panelists like to add something to this because it says the COVID-19 effect uh, on uh, the availability of services. So um, would anybody else like to add something? Would our plenary speaker like to say something on that? Yes. Uh, so, sorry, what was your question, please? That because of COVID-19, there has been a lot of disruption in the services uh, regarding uh, uh, HIV testing and availability of services to the young. So what uh, initiatives are being taken to overcome that? Yeah, actually, I, I tried to mention a little bit in my presentation mm. that uh, due to this restriction in movement, you can't do whatever is actually needed. So the uh, national uh, committee uh, formed by the government and they are finding out the strategies how to go about this. But initially, whatever could be done through you know use of uh, tele telephone or media or mass media or social media, uh, some sort of advocacy things could be done. And now in Bangladesh, uh, limited uh, scopes are open, open now because people can come and come to the uh, you know, service centers because uh, from last week, uh, government uh, has opened the offices and service centers. So, uh, but the important thing is the panic, the minutes about the COVID-19. As, as long as these uh, people are um, scary about, scared about the COVID, so it will definitely hamper, but it's still use of, you know, digital technology and uh, telemedicine would help to a great extent until the normal things come. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Jonathan uh, Flavier and some others also for Dr. Muazzam Ali. Uh, in your presentation, in your study, Dr. Ali, uh, it was seen that male sterilization was zero at baseline and at end, end line, both in the control and intervention groups. But female sterilization increased almost twofold in both arms. So does the Muslim practice prevent male surgical contraception? Or there are, are there other reasons for limited male acceptance of uh, family planning methods? And are any efforts being made to increase uptake of male sterilization, particularly in the context of Pakistan? Elsewhere also, it is very low in other countries as well. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, the One of the things that um, we need to understand is that uh, First of all, I think I'll, I'll touch upon the female sterilization. Female sterilization is one of the most popular method in many of the South Asian countries, including Pakistan. And along with condoms, these two uh, constitute, I think the majority of the contraception, um, modern contraception in, in Pakistan at the moment. Uh, regarding the male contraception, so female sterilization is still the most popular. I think one of the challenge in Pakistan uh, for the female sterilization is that if you look at the average age of female sterilization, many of the women who get the sterilization, they get it uh, past the age of 35 years. They are between 35 to 40 years. So many of these women who, who get this uh, surgical procedure, they've already completed their family and they are four or five plus children already. So I'm not sure if it is effective in, in controlling what they intend to do. So this is one, one perspective I just wanted to highlight on. Regarding the male sterilization, I think it has to do with some uh, masculinity and uh, the thoughts about how and why men should do uh, the male sterilization. Like in many other countries uh, globally, uh, it is not very popular in Pakistan, despite the efforts of the government. And uh, there were 10, 15 years ago, there was a very specific campaign on male sterilization through the mass media, including the television and the newspaper. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, not much uh, was you know, achieved during this uh, 
So I think like uh, as is at the global level, uh, the success has not been much um, in, in the context of Pakistan also for male sterilization. They still go for uh, condoms if we talk about the male method, which is very, very popular in Pakistan. Uh, but uh, it's very difficult to, to comment on why they are low, but I think it has to do with the role of masculinity and other things uh, in the local context, in the traditional uh, role of men. Okay, there, there is a, another question uh, for, to know the reason why IUD use is so low in Pakistan. And this question is from Kalpana Acharya, who is chairperson of the Health uh, Journalist Network Association of Nepal and a very senior uh, journalist from Nepal. She wants to know why IUD use is so low in Pakistan. I think it has to do with a couple of things. First of all, I think it is the, you know, the methods which are popular in, in different countries, they are mostly because a woman uses a method because a friend of uh, that woman has used a method or their relatives have used or recommended a particular method. It also has to do with the policies of the government if they want to promote a method. I mean, and uh, we also did a systematic review, especially on the IUD to look at the reason why IUD is low in many countries compared to others. And one of the things that came across was that uh, number one, the time and the skills it needs for insertion and removal and the privacy it needs. Sometimes the provider bias also comes into play and they are not very much interested in taking time to do insertion, removal, counseling and all that uh, related to the IUD. And in, in few countries, uh, including Pakistan, it was also noted that since the IUD, um, IUD, I would say demand is generally low. So many of the healthcare worker also lose their confidence and skill in insertion and removal. Uh, so at the end, I mean, they are reluctant to offer these services when a woman even demands for it. So, I mean, there are multiple factors where not difficult, not easy to point out to a particular thing. So uh, there are multiple things that are happening in the context of IUD, but there are countries where it is up to 25% in some uh, African countries. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Ali, we are not going to let you leave you in peace right now. Uh, we have a question from Ghanshyam Pokharal of Nepal, who wants to know that uh, in Pakistan, the MCPR is 26%. But mm -hmm. unmet need is only 20%. Why? Oh. Well, I think it has to do more with uh, the, the method mix of traditional and the modern method and how they mix up. Because in, in the context of Pakistan, the traditional method are quite high, especially the withdrawal, the lactational amenorrhea. The withdrawal is quite popular in Pakistan. So I think when we look at the overall uh, method mix, uh, the number goes up and the unmet need is basically for, for the modern method, which is approximately according to DHS is 20%. So I think it is the mixing of different methods and when we put them together, this is how it comes up to. Thank you. Uh, we have a question by Deepak Dungal, a country program manager for Nepal at AIDS Healthcare Foundation. And Deepak wants to know how can CSE, uh, comprehensive sexuality education be scaled up in all public and private schools uh, and in terms of innovations how can governments be made accountable for offering SRX services in all communities Ashish would you like to say something on that? Um, I think that is a very very complicated question that probably doesn't have uh, an easy answer because it's different for uh, for different contexts. I think CSC has been a complex issue uh, based on uh, the political context. Uh, so, but but certainly, I think you know it's it's absolutely important for CSC to be as widely available as possible. But I think uh, it will need contextual uh, solutions as opposed to sort of an overarching uh, regional solution. I would say. 
unfortunately that may not be the uh, that may not be may not be an answer but that's that that is the reality unfortunately okay thank you would anybody else like to comment on that any other uh, speaker okay we can we have a question for uh, loida from jude tayaban and jude wants to know uh, are there studies conducted to know to what extent and how efficient and effective the ppp model is as innovative financing strategy have there been studies on that? yeah there are, there are yeah there are some studies on uh, ppp in the philippines however um these are non-health uh, public-private uh, partnerships. Um, you can explore uh, studies from ADB and other uh, organizations. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We have uh, a Ms. question. Ms. Loida, just, just a quick follow-up. Ms. Loida, were they on these sort of bridge funding type of mechanisms that sort of provided in between loans at zero interest? Uh, and, and do you have a sense of whether those in the non-health sector have been uh, successful? Actually, the, uh, it's not on the bridge funding me mechanism. This is just an innovation that uh, we demonstrated in our uh, project. And we would like to explore more on that to generate more resources for our CSOs. Thank you. Uh, we have a question by Abdul Rahman from Bangladesh. And the question is for Mr. Kazi Islam. Uh, Abdul says that Mr. Kazi, you have made a lifetime contribution to family planning in the government. What were the top challenges or barriers you faced to raise funding for SRHR when in office? Would you share some of those challenges? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, actually, SRHR issues are being talked about in Bangladesh for a long time, and uh, it is not very easy to talk about this sexual and reproductive health with the people uh, who are, you know, waiting uh, for receiving this kind of support. Like, if you go to the schools, if you talk to the adolescents, young people, it, it, in the in our social context, it's not that easy to talk about the sex and the sexual health. But still many, uh, our government is serious about, about this and uh, uh, for SRHR programs, uh, the Department of uh, Director General of Family Planning, they have a special separate uh, projects, we call it operational plans for uh, providing support uh, for, for the SRHR program and uh, also there are many uh, non-government organizations and agency organizations, they are also also trying to come forward to, to help in uh, the SRHR program. And the Edison Friendly Corner established in Bangladesh and gradually the number is increasing. Through those corners, SRHR programs are being supported. So uh, initially uh, the funds, managing funds were difficult, but gradually the usefulness of the centers are proving proving worthy. So uh, hopefully in future the, the problem will be, will be less and less. Okay. There's one more question for you, uh, yes. Mr. Islam. Uh, and uh, the uh, maternal, maternal mortality ratio is very high in Bangladesh. As of now, it is uh, 173 per 100,000 live births. And the target, uh, the global target is to reach 70 by 2030. And uh, COVID-19 also must have had an impact on it. So are any special efforts being made by Bangladesh to reach that target of 70 by 2030? Uh, there, has been, there has been a mention of your innovation, Nayor, which is aimed on women empowerment. Is it focusing on this to reduce the maternal mortality rate? Uh, hello. hello. Yes. Yes. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, hello? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, we are also worried about the maternal mortality. Although the, the mortality is uh, gradually decreasing, it was a huge number in, in 1970, 71. 
uh, but now the, the the number is gradually decreasing and uh, uh, it's around uh, even less than 100 170 but the major you know breakthrough we can make is uh, we have to reduce the child marriage that is the crux of the problem uh, and uh, so far we know we, in the field level in the administration our our local administration they all are concertedly trying to reduce this uh, uh, child marriage so uh, if we could reduce the child marriage the maternal mortality which is directly related with the child marriage will be reduced to a great extent so our efforts are now concentrated on uh, the, the reduction of uh, child marriage uh, that will eventually help us in achieving the target of the LGBT. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Uh, I think we have already overshot the time, so I will just take up one more question, uh, which is there. Shoba, uh, yes, yes, please. Shoba, please. Can I make a quick, quick recommendation? Since please. you know Angela, uh, yes, Professor yes. Dawson had intended to sort of raise awareness about the the Asia Pacific Consortium. Yes. Would yes. would would it be possible for us to put her email address uh, in the chat box? so that okay. uh, interested parties can raise questions to her directly. I think she is anticipating that she can individually respond. Yes. So if we can, so to, yes, sure, to sure. those who had questions, uh, we, can, we will have her email address in the chat box shortly. Yes. Uh, I, I, sorry, Shoba, go ahead. No, yeah. that's fine. I think Bobby will do that. He will put the, her email out in the chat box right away. And I just go on to the last question uh, for today's session. Uh, that is by Dr. Mahin Zari from Iran. Uh, Dr. Mahin says that in countries that have uh, regressive laws against certain aspects of SRHR. What are the innovative ways of funding for those components of SRHR? For example, uh, and as Dr. Zehra Fati had mentioned in her presentation, for those who are using drugs, for LGBTI communities, and for sex workers. And particularly, she wants to know in the context of Iran and Jordan. But if, for Iran, Dr. Zehra, would you like to say something to that? innovative ways for funding for those components which are actually which have regressive laws against them uh, yeah uh, actually the uh, because of the u.s sanctioning against iran uh, we are uh, we have some difficulty for receiving funds from out of outside of the country and uh, so we have to use uh, some uh, funds uh, in Iran. Uh, for uh, for example, for this project, we um, negotiated with governments and also non-governmental organization and also some private section and uh, some companies for uh, allocating some budget for treatment of uh, people who are infected by HCV in Iran. In for other uh, the issue and for other uh, programs, uh, also can uh, FHA Iran have this experience to use. Uh, other um, the, uh, the funds are from the donors and the private company and the government. Also, in the past and before this uh, huge sanction against Iran, we have some project with uh, uh, European Commission and uh, other uh, organization, international organization, Japan Impasse and other international organization uh, for our project. But nowadays, uh, we have some difficulty for receiving our funds. Uh, because all the way for receiving the funds from the outside of the country is blocked and we have uh, many difficulties for that. Uh, but uh, we can use uh, some uh, funds from the inside the country like uh, private company and government and other things. Okay, thank you. And uh, with this, we come to the close of the sixth session of APCR SHR 10 virtual. My sincere, sincere thanks to the chairperson the plenary speaker, abstract presenters, and to the audience. I would also like to thank UNFPA and IPPF for all their support and help to APCR SHR 10 virtual. We will now meet on Monday, September 14 at 12 noon Cambodia time for the seventh APCR SHR 10 virtual session on the theme of population aging, SRHR, and Asia Pacific. And that is in the lead up to the International Day of Older Persons, which happens to be on October 1. Bye till then, stay safe, safe, stay healthy, and stay connected. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all.